What is going on, New York Giant fans? Welcome back to another edition of the Big Blue in the Bronx podcast. Hit, make sure you hit the like button, comment, and subscribe. Turn on post notifications so you know when a live stream pops or video drops. Appreciate y'all coming back. Share this out. Um, five stars on Apple Podcasts. Do all the good stuff. Real quickly, I'd just like to thank everybody for getting us to the 1.7K mark and about 30, 33 subscribers over the threshold. And we continue to grow as a channel in multiple different ways, doing multiple different things content-wise. And there's definitely more to come. As I mentioned, every time we're going to the Senior Bowl, the end of January, so that should be really fun. A lot of scouting and stuff like that. Um, but all the good stuff, but it's all thanks to you guys. I do mention in the second half that we are a few subscribers away from 1.7K. That's obviously not accurate, or maybe if I do, I don't. But at the time it was recorded, uh, we were not at 1.7K yet, or we might have been. I don't know, but uh, that was recorded before this part. And let's get into it. So the New York Giants play a Christmas game. Now, I don't remember the last time they actually played a Christmas game, but they're playing on Christmas against the Philadelphia Eagles, which knowing coming into this year, we knew was going to be a very tough game to win. A very hostile territory in Philadelphia. Not to mention now, you add everything in, the Giants are dealing with a shit ton of injuries, and especially their defensive line, which we'll get into. Their quarterback is Tommy DeVito, a lot of missing pieces for the New York Giants, and that really doesn't match up well against a very much healthy Eagles team. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, so for the Eagles, they're looking pissed off, and they're looking to get a get-right game against the New York Giants. They lost against Seattle, Dallas, and San Fran. I guess that's a backward chronological order. They want to maintain themselves as the leader of the NFC East. And they also want to try to get that number one seed, even though San Francisco is right now in the lead for it, at least to my knowledge. So there's a lot on the line here, right? They play us twice in three weeks. They're looking to get two wins. And the Giants don't have much to play for. Everyone else is just riding out a contract. So let's get into the injury report. Lawrence Cager is questionable with a groin injury. The Giants, I believe, have four tight ends on the roster right now. It's Daniel Bellinger... Lawrence Cager, Dan, uh, Darren Waller, and I think there's a fourth guy on there, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure they have a fourth tight end. If they don't, my apologies. Let's take a look at the roster, but I'm pretty sure they have four tight ends. No, they only have three. Okay, so only three tight ends. But also as well, you move down the list, Dexter Lawrence, limited in practice on Saturday, did not practice Thursday and Friday. He is questionable. Likely will give it a go, but is injured. So I question the amount of impact he will actually have in the running game. And, of course, rushing the passer. So Evan Neal is out, ankle injury. If you guys haven't already, please check out my video on whether he's a bust or not. Rakim Nunez Roches damages the D-line depth. He is out with a knee injury. Ashawn Robinson, back injury. He is questionable. Expected to give it a go. And Gary Brightwell, he is questionable He is expected to give it a go and be back. So the Giants will have the amount of running backs they need. I think at some point they'll probably cut Jay Sean Corbin because they got Gray back, they have Breida, they have Barkley, and you know Corbin probably just gets released or put on the practice squad however they see fit. Uh, Not to mention the Giants do not have Cade York. The Giants do not have Randy Bullock. They instead have former Green Bay kicker Mason Crosby. Not like our kicker situation gets any better. Now, I think Mason Crosby is better than Randy Bullock. I don't know if he's better than Cade York because Cade York is younger, but nonetheless, looks like Crosby will be our kicker for the next three games, which is the remainder of the season. The only ones questionable for the Eagles, uh, Zach Cunningham, I know of, Devonta Smith, he probably will give it a go because, hey, it's the Giants, and Cam Jurgens is back. Other than that, Nothing else, and also Avante Maddox is trying to work his way back from the injury that landed him on IR. So let's take a look at the New York Giants stat breakdown. 31st in total yards per game. They're also 31st in points. 32nd in the passing game and 15th in the rushing game. Defensively, 24th in total yards per game, 19th in passing, 29th against the run, 25th in points. 
21st in pass percentage, 12th in run percentage, 29th in pass percentage on first down, 13th in run percentage on first down, 2nd in blitz percentage, 19th in pressure percentage, and 31st in the NFL in sacks. Does not help. Now you go to the Eagles. Very much different situation from where we are. 9th in total yards per game, 16th in passing offense, 8th in rushing, 7th in points. Defensively, not a good state, except defending the run. 22nd in total yards, 28th against the pass, 7th against the run, 26th in points per game. And then you take a look at the analytic breakdown, 28th in pass percentage, 5th in run percentage, 27th in pass percentage on first down, 4th in run percentage on first down, 24th in blitz percentage, 11th in pressure percentage, and I believe they are pretty high in sacks this season. They're about middle of the pack. Uh, which obviously is not usually where they are. They're usually top of the league. I think last year they may have had the most sacks in the league, but that kind of has dropped a little bit, especially with the uh, departure of Jonathan Gannon. Now let me get to this uh, passing defense stat so I can get the rank of where they rank in sets, uh, the sacks. Excuse me. Uh, they have 39 of the season, which is tied for the New York Jets and Steelers and the Seahawks too, but let's see, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14th in sacks in the NFL. So not bad, but you expect the talent to do a little bit more. So let's go to things to look for. There's going to be a lot of things to look for, believe it or not, because there's going to be so many moving variables, and a lot of people say, well, Alex, guess what? The Giants don't have anything to play for, but there's still things for the Eagles to play for, and there's still a lot of moving variables. Number one, Giants more of a passing emphasis. The pass defense is terrible for the Philadelphia Eagles. And they will look to do every single thing to damage Tommy DeVito, to get him to, you know, take sacks like he's never taken before. Well, to be fair, that's not really an accurate statement because he's taken a lot of sacks in his heyday, which has been the past few weeks, except for the Green Bay game, which looked like an anomaly. But I do expect maybe a little bit more of a passing emphasis. I do expect... Maybe a tidbit of the running game, but we'll talk about that in just a second. More passing emphasis, getting Wandale Robinson involved. They're dealing with an injury to Darius Slay, who really hasn't played well this season. But it's going to be James Bradbury, Kaylee Ringo, the rookie from Georgia, and I believe Josh Joby or Eli Ricks in the slot. So you could look for more of a passing emphasis. Maybe you try to go downfield a little bit more with Jalen Hyatt. Who knows what the game plan is going to be. Saquon in the passing game. That's another one. Saquon and Darren Waller are two guys I'm really eyeing in the passing game versus these linebackers. Shaq Leonard really hasn't had much impact. Cunningham hasn't been good. Their overall inside linebacker look has not been good since the departure of TJ Edwards, who went to the Bears in the offseason. So that's, that's not good. Um, They've had problems with linebackers for years, but T.J. Edwards was like that kind of glue to the linebacking core. You know, Alex Singleton, Duke Riley, those guys didn't work out in a Philly uniform. But I would look for Saquon in the passing game a little bit just to see, you know, Tommy DeVito, let's just say the pressure him. I guess so he's going to get that throw out, that swing pass to Saquon Barkley. But at the same time, if Sean Desai and or Matt Patricia are smart, they're going to say, hey, they're going to game plan this, but we have to be ready to stop it. Let's go to the defense. Um, also, actually, switch back on offense just a little bit. I touched on it with the passing emphasis. Uh, more of a blitz than usual for Matt Patricia. Obviously, these guys haven't gotten home a ton. There's games where they get sacks, games where they don't get sacks. But I think this is going to be a big cleanup game for the Philadelphia Eagles in terms of that. And Matt Patricia will know this offensive line is garbage. The quarterback is not so good. And whether they have a back end or not, they're going to blitz the shit out of us. My opinion. If they play zone, though, the Giants will at least put up a touchdown. Um, Running game emphasis from Philly. Now, I could say, yeah, they could go against a passing game, you know, or I should say go into a more of a passing emphasis. You know, uh, Dory Jackson had a horrible last game, a rookie Deontay Banks. But I think bigger than that, you look at the run defense, right? No Raheem Nunez Ochez, possibly no Sean Robinson. Dexter Lawrence is hurt, going to give it a try, which leaves you Jordan Riley, DJ Davidson, and Timmy Horn. I don't know who the hell Timmy Horn is. Now, truthfully, though, he was an undrafted free agent for the Falcons in 2022. He has 27 tackles and one pass deflection. I don't really know why they sought his help. 
I'm surprised they didn't really go to a guy who's on the practice squad like Ryan uh, Ryder Anderson, excuse me. So there's going to be all sorts of rotations within the defensive line. I don't expect any of it to be a good product for the New York Giants. I think Micah McFadden, Isaiah Simmons, and Bobby Okereke, they will have to work extra hard, and I don't even know if that's going to be good enough against DeAndre Swift, against Kenny Gainwell, Rashad Penny. I mean, they really haven't seen a lot out of him. I think this will be the game where Eagle fans are like, that's that's what we've been waiting for. Like, you ever you see the SpongeBob reference of he's cooking up the, uh, the, the Krabby Patties and then the people are out there like, that's what we've been waiting for. Well, a lot of Eagle fans sincerely believe that the missing component of the offense is the fact that they really don't run the ball a lot. So there's that and zone coverage wink. Um, I definitely expect wink to do zone coverage again. Now, I don't know if it's going to be that way the, the, two, the two games in a row because that would look a little bit weird on wink's part in terms of a game plan. Hey, two, day, two games in a row, you're going with the same shit. Um, but it seems like last year that's what they did. Um, and they kind of have a similar corner situation. I mean, Adoree was out last year. So now you have Adoree, Banks, Flot, and whoever you want to mix in. I mean, you have McLeod too. But I just don't think he's going to play man against A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith. I think he might play some zone coverage of like, let's keep it out of the end zone type, which the problem with that is time of possession leaks out. And that's where I say the Giants might try to run the football early because they want to slow down the game for the Eagles and not have them put up 70 points. Um, let's go to players to watch. So we'll look at the Eagles stat category with the stats, the quarterback, all that other good stuff. So Jalen Hurts on the season, 12 interceptions, 19 touchdowns, 3,335 Yards, 65.7 completion percentage, which is pretty good considering that he's the type of quarterback that, you know, doesn't really care about completion percentage. The interceptions are up. The fumbles are up on his part. Five fumbles, four of them lost. He's their second leading rusher at 542 yards, 3.9 yards per carry, and 14 rushing touchdowns. So you do have that. Um, you move to the running game, as I mentioned. You got DeAndre Swift, who has 896 yards. So that's. 104 away from the 1,000 mark, which he might eclipse against the Giants. Four runs, of, excuse me, four touchdowns, six runs over 20, two fumbles this year, 64 yards per game, 4.6 yards per carry. Then you got Kenny Gainwell, 256 yards, 69 carries, uh, two touchdowns, one run over 20. And then we have to review this guy. It's not Rashad Penny by any means. It's Boston Scott because you know that – if you're a better or a Giants fan in general or an Eagles fan or someone who knows this rivalry, quote-unquote, uh, Boston Scott will have a touchdown against the Giants. If he doesn't, it's going to be 90 degrees uh, the following day. But 78 yards on the season in the running game, 16 carries, 4.9 yards per carry, had one 18-yard run, and that's about it. The receiving game, A.J. Brown having another stellar season, 20 plays over 20. Seven touchdowns, 1,114 yards, 95 catches. So we'll probably end up with 100 after this game. Uh, one fumble that was lost. Devonta Smith, 957 yards, six touchdowns, 13 plays over the 20-yard mark, 74 catches. And then I'll add in two more. Uh, Dallas Goddard, 46 catches, 470 yards, two touchdowns, four plays over 20. And also you got to add in uh, Quez Watkins as well. Seven catches, 49 yards, no touchdowns or anything like that. But also, yeah, I'll, I'll add in uh, Olamide Zikaeus. Eight catches, 144 yards, two touchdowns, four plays over 20. Then again, too, I feel like Julio Jones is going to have a touchdown against us in this, this game. Because last week, it was Wash Jimmy Graham. Now, guess who it is? Or who it could be, Julio Jones. So you look at the offensive line right. Um, they've done a very good job of keeping Jalen Hurts upright. Jordan Maylotta... Five penalties, three sacks. Landon Dickerson, nine penalties, three sacks. Five penalties, one sack for Jason Kelsey, Cam Jurgens, Zero penalties, zero sacks. And Lane Johnson, three penalties and three sacks. Now, again, just to throw it out there, I would look for precisely Lane Johnson to be moving early on snaps because that's what he does. Will the officials call it? 
I'm going to say probably not, but I would look for it anyway. So that's Giant Defenders and watching in the film room and Giant fans as well. Move over to the defensive side of the ball. We're going to talk about a couple of different guys. Let's talk about Jalen Carter. Five sacks, seven TFLs, eight quarterback hits, 17 quarterback pressures, and you also have 28 tackles from him. You go to another guy. We're going to go to Jordan Davis now, who's had a solid season. Um, two and a half sacks, five quarterback hits, two TFLs, and nine quarterback pressures. Then you go to Hassan Riddick, who on the season has 11 sacks, 34 tackles, uh, eight tackles for loss, 19 quarterback hits, 30 quarterback pressures. And finally, Josh Sweat, 36 tackles, six and a half sacks, seven TFLs, 22 quarterback hits, and 35 quarterback pressures. So he's more of the quarterback hits slash quarterback pressures type. That's fine. Hassan Riddick does most of the dirty work. Uh, Zach Cunningham on the season eight, 80 tackles, one quarterback hit, two TFLs, four pass deflections, a fumble recovery, and a quarterback pressure. Right now, in terms of coverage, here's how he's looking. A total of 74.5 uh, completion percentage, no interceptions, 259 yards, giving up one touchdown, 91.9 passer rating, which isn't all bad considering. Then you move to Shaq Leonard. Again, not much of an impact thus far. 71 tackles, one quarterback hit, two TFLs, and a quarterback pressure on the season in coverage. He has given up a passer rating of 92.5, a completion percentage of 62.5, one touchdown, um, and also 141 yards total. But he has to get more uh, playing time with the Eagles, of course, because in these games, they're trying to ease him in. You move to the secondary, and I'm looking at two guys. I'm looking at James Bradbury first, which if there's any way the Giants can exploit him, you know, they, you got to make it happen. You got to make it happen. Um, a lot of people disagree with each other on the way James Bradbury plays. A lot of people think he's a zone corner. A lot of people think he's a bump and run man corner. I disagree. I think he's a zone corner. I never really saw the man fit. But he's given up 11 touchdowns this season. Had a horrific drive against the Seattle Seahawks. 117.7 passer rating, one interception, 60% completion, which again isn't bad, 663 yards, but 11 touchdowns and 117.7 passer rating, that's the worst he's ever had in his career since Pro Football Reference started tracking these type of statistics. Then you go to Kelly Ringo, who's played 14 games thus far, um, one pass deflection, a fumble recovery, eight tackles, and in coverage. One completion allowed on three targets, 33% completion, 39 yards, 81.9 passer rating. So he has to get his feet under him a little bit more, but of course you'll see him mixed in there. Darius Slay's not going to play. Before we go to top matchups, we have to talk about SeatGeek. SeatGeek sponsors us, and we thank them for it. SeatGeek is your one-stop shop for uh, concert tickets, tailgate tickets, and ballgame tickets. $20 off your entire order with the promo code Big Blue in the Bronx. That's Big Blue in the Bronx. Nothing abbreviated, the name of the podcast, the name of the channel. So let's take a look at top matchups. I'm looking at Kayvon Thibodeau and Aziz versus Jordan Maylotta and Lane Johnson. Aziz was very quiet last game. That doesn't really surprise me. Kayvon Thibodeau, right? Uh, Lane Johnson obviously has the little trick right there of committing some false starts and early movements. Maylotta's a little bit of a lesser toned tackle, but he's still pretty good. And I'm really going to look for something. And I know he's only one player that's going to be fully healthy and actually good on the defensive line. Well, I can't really say front seven, just the defensive line. Um, but what I will say is this, right? There's this narrative that the guys don't show up against the Eagles and, and the Cowboys. Now, Thibodeau, I think, had a sack last year in that blowout game. Or maybe he had two. But I'm looking for him to get some pressure on Jalen Hurts. Personally, me. Watching the defense. Um, Aziz, we already talked about. Devonta Smith versus Deontay Banks. I think that's who Deontay Banks will be trailing. Devonta Smith, another solid season. I think Devonta Smith will win his battles. I don't think he's going to cook Deontay Banks too many times, but I think his Banks will have his fair share of plays, depending on the, the amount of pressure that the New York Giants put on Jalen Hurts. And it can't be done through a zone blitz because Devonta Smith will be wide open. This one I'm concerned about, and I'm thinking that the Giants should honestly – have some safety help. Adoree Jackson versus A.J. Brown, his former teammate. Um, Adoree Jackson was not good last game. A.J. Brown has had a hell of a fucking season. And I think safety help needs to be involved. 
He's number one corner, but at the same time, A.J. Brown is more phenomenal at his position than Adoree is at his. So there's that. You move on, Dallas Goddard versus Xavier McKinney or Jason Pinnock. I think they'll put Pinnock in coverage against Goddard, but I'm really looking for Xavier McKinney to be there because I think McKinney's been solid in coverage this season. I haven't been totally happy with his comments, but I think he's been solid in coverage. He has had a quiet season in some games. Some games are just like, oh my God, he can't be doing this. He can't be sitting here missing tackles. You move a little bit to the offensive side of the football, Andrew Thomas versus Josh Sweat. He gave up a sack to Josh Sweat last year. Um... But that was pretty much when the game was over. With that being said and on the table, I think Andrew Thomas should pretty much stonewall Josh Sweat. He's done it to Rashawn Gary and multiple other edge rushers. Uh, Why would Josh Sweat be any different? Jalen Hyatt or Darius Slayton versus Bradbury. Sometimes we look at the game plan, right? Hey, Jalen Hyatt's going to exploit this receiver or this guy's going to exploit this guy or whatever. Sometimes it ends up being Darius Slayton who cooks these guys. And I haven't been extremely happy with Slayton, but hey, Slayton sometimes gets the better of corners you think are better than him at their respective positions. And Bradbury, I think he could be in for a rude awakening, a little bit more of a rude awakening if we actually had a quarterback, but that's not the case. And then finally, Justin Pugh and JMS for a rebound game for the both of them against Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter, especially Jalen Carter, who looks to be one of the top guys for Defensive Player of the Year. Keys to win. We're looking to pressure Jalen Hurts. That's number one. Uh, If you pressure him, you're going to cause fumbles, force turnovers, get the ball in the Giants' hands, and the Giants can do whatever they want with the ball, turn it over if they like. But jokingly, that's what I mean. Seriously, what I mean is running the football, just being efficient on offense, time and possession. Number two is defending the run. Dexter Lawrence is not going to play healthy uh, if he plays at all. Kayvon Thibodeau is going to be the only solid guy in there. Sean Robinson is questionable. Aziz can't play the run. Jordan Riley and DJ Davidson are probably going to get stonewalled by the interior. Defending the run is going to be one of the most important things in this game, especially for time and possession. Number three, get the passing game going. That's one thing. If they're going to play high-level offense, you got to play high-level offense or at least try to with them. you got to keep pace because if you're running the football – and it's not working, and they're passing the football, it's working, it's going to be such a blowout. It's not even funny. People will turn it off at the end of the first quarter if they even watch the game at all. So get the passing game going. Exploit James Bradbury. Exploit their linebackers. Right? Go to Darren Waller. Go to Saquon Barkley. But unfortunately, folks, uh, I do not see the Giants winning this one. I think it's going to be a blowout. 34-10 Eagles victory. Um, again, I'm usually a guy that says, hey, the Giants will you know, have this game close than most people expect, but uh, the Giants just have a lot of missing pieces, a lot of missing variables, and the Eagles have a pissed-off mentality that's going to work against the Giants, and the Giants will be the punching bag. So with that being said, let's turn over to the discussion with Jeffrey Knox, who is the editor at Inside Eagles. All right, so now we have on Jeffrey Knox, who is with us, I think, for the second Eagles game uh, last year, and he is the editor for Inside Eagles. Um, My first question, Jeff, before we go into what actually has transpired so far this season, is what were your first thoughts on both of your coordinators last year getting head coaching jobs, Shane Steichen to Indy, Jonathan Gannon to the Arizona Cardinals. And do you think that the team misses them? And if they miss them, do they miss one particular guy most? Uh, No surprises as far as the coordinator positions. Uh, Shane Steichen is a brilliant offensive mind. I think he's demonstrated that again in Indy and prior to his tenure in Philadelphia. Um, Jonathan Gannon had been on a lot of radars for quite some time. And um, 70 sacks and one of the best defensive seasons in NFL history definitely isn't going to hurt that as far as that's concerned. Um, Jonathan Gannon, I think it's a raw deal for the way things ended um, for what we perceive to be a lack of attention and focus during the Super Bowl. But uh, Jonathan Gannon was an excellent head coach. Um, got out coached in the Super Bowl, obviously, and that was um, easy to see. But uh, it's, hard to dem- it's hard to deny 70 sacks. Uh, this team has dropped off to, I think, six total interceptions this year. Yes, C.J. Gardner Johnson had six interceptions by himself. And while some were also thinking that um, there was a possibility that maybe some of the issue was he didn't blitz enough, it's what we started recognizing and pulling the stats and looking at those 
uh, more intently was that these teams that blitz more often aren't teams that are winning. And it's the fact that, you know, the type of coverage he plays that allows these guys to get six interceptions, it allows guys to get to the quarterback seven times. So I think they miss both. Um, I think they will probably miss Shane Steichen more based on the fact that um, we're just not liking what we're seeing from a creative standpoint as far as play calling on the offensive side of the ball. And this is Nick Sirianni's offense, but we would assume that I think it was 2021 he uh, he gave up play calling duties. And I think that was right after the Raiders game. We saw some improvement. Shane did what he did to make the uh, team comfortable as far as like uh, pounding it with the rushing attack. But there was a tendency I saw in Shane second that I haven't seen all this year. Whenever there were times where Jalen Hurts would struggle or get a little uh, out of sorts, for lack of a better term, Shane was very good at calling plays to get Jalen in a rhythm um, to kind of settle him down. And that's just not what we've seen this year. Which actually goes into my next question is, what are your overall thoughts on the way Jalen Hurts played this year? It seems like the turnovers are more exposed, obviously, especially in this uh, three-game losing streak guys are on. You know, people are sparring, hey, he's possibly injured. Is it his OC being gone? You know, obviously, you mentioned a little bit about that, but if you want to go into it a little bit more. Uh, well, he is injured from what we understand. Um that doesn't that may seem to dictate some of his base from time to time, and it may also dictate his ability to run and have that explosive that we've seen. Uh, it looks like something he's just going to linger and something he's going to deal with. Uh, the illness obviously played a part in what was going on in Seattle a little bit, but um, play calling has just been atrocious at times, for lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, Jalen, Jalen, I believe, is somehow suffering from this need to want to prove that he's worth the big time contract that he's been given. And the coordinators and coaches are suffering from this desire to want to make this team a passing team, even though sometimes the run may be more appropriate. So there's a consistent ideology of trying to put more of an emphasis on explosive plays and things down the field. So routes are taking too long to develop. Um, Jalen is, you have two at Sunga below getting rid of the ball in three seconds. Jalen is more than doubling it on in more on a consistent basis, but, uh, I think it's a little bit all that. And um, as far as Brian Johnson is concerned, he's another guy that, despite what we're talking about now, is one of those guys that's popping up on all these lists for potential head coaching candidates. And um, you typically don't get those jobs by running the football. You tend to get those by having quarterbacks who are MVP caliber quarterbacks who are winning the MVP trophy and lightening up with their arm. Yeah, definitely. And my next question, we, we you discussed it a little bit there, is uh, the running game. What are your thoughts on the usage of DeAndre Swift? Because I remember when he came over and I, I mean, I watched a few a Eagles games and he was actually pretty good. And, you know, has the usage toned down a little bit? I tend to want to believe De DeAndre Swift has already exceeded um, a career high in total yards, both uh, receiving and passing as a combined stat. And, uh, uh, probably pretty close to close to approaching, if not already eclipsing uh, carries and things of that nature. DeAndre is also somebody we've seen that had a little bit of uh, some structural issues and some some uh, the and, and lack of ability to stay healthy. So I think the thing that's going on with him is um, though we want to see more of him, I think the team worries about whether or not he can actually handle the full load and do so on a you know four quarter, seventeen game, eighteen week basis. So I think some of the desire is to try to spare him a little bit. I think they thought they would probably get more out of Kenny Gainwell. And I still still think they can. I think there's a lack of usage with Kenny Gainwell, but they trust him. Uh, they kind of tend to want to make him their goal line guy, the uh, red zone guy, and the uh, the, the guy in high pressure situations like too many warnings and things of that nature. But um, Kenneth, I think, could be used a little bit more appropriately. And I'm still not knowing what's going on with Rashad Penny. I, I think that's the issue. I think they thought they were going to get more out of him. So being able to develop this rotation of uh, Kenneth Gainwell, Rashad Penny, and DeAndre Swift hasn't worked out the way they're supposed to be, and um, we just haven't seen a whole lot of Rashad at all. Uh, Boston Scott is a guy who they tend to want to save for Giants games, um, but my my argument with him has always been that if, the, if Boston can be that effective against the Giants, I don't know why we don't believe that he can't be that effective against anybody else. So, but – uh, undrafted guy, um, and they got a little bit more invested in some of the other guys. Kenneth Gainwell was a draft choice, the only running back that's actually signed past this season. So um, I understand the need for wanting to get more work out of them, but Boston is somebody they could use a lot more, and I think we'll probably see that again tomorrow. 
Yeah. Um, I'll state this right now. I definitely think that Boston Scott's going to have a touchdown. Yeah. Definitely going to have a touchdown this game. Good guy um, to take his anytime touchdown score. Yeah. If, if you're, if you're somebody who bets, you can bet on that. Um, maybe this is me as an outsider, but I just feel that Dallas Goddard maybe has not been impactful as much this season, or is it just everybody's focusing on AJ Brown getting the most attention in the offense? Dallas Goddard has not been impactful, and that's been a little bit of a disappointment. Um, some of what we've seen all season long is, I think, beginning to catch up with the Philadelphia Eagles. And I, I understand the desire when you have A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, and Dallas Goddard to kind of make those guys the three main guys in your offense. But um, I think we're spamming them a little too much. I don't understand what the uh, the fixation is with uh, Quez Watkins at this point. Um, the next time he fights for the ball or tries to break up a pass, that looks like it's a bad pass on his direction. Will be the first time he does it. Dallas Goddard, um, some of the, the injury did some of that. And um, what tends to happen is the Eagles, with so many weapons, have struggled with this ability to get the ball to everybody and get the ball in as many capable hands as possible, as often as possible. And in some, so sometimes what you see is you'll have a game where A.J. Brown's on the sideline because he's not getting the ball enough or – Devontae Smith is shut out on catches, or Devon, uh, Dallas got it with shut off his catches. The, uh, A.J. Brown's first game of the season last year against Detroit, Devontae didn't get anything thrown in his direction that time. So, um, unfortunately, it happens a lot, and um, we've seen as a result the desire then is to try to reward the guys who didn't get the ball next by trying to spam them a little bit more often in the in the games that follow. But I would totally agree with you. Dallas got his usage as being kind of disappointing as far as I'm concerned. And I think um, – Needs to be more of him as we start to go down these this home stretch and start to get into the postseason. Yeah, definitely. And there was rumors that Devontae Smith is, is injured. Is he going to play this week? We don't know. Um, missed two straight practices. Um, Devontae is always seemingly dealing with something. It always seems to be a hamstring or a knee issue. So I think this has just been going on for a couple of years. And it's just something that um, youth has just allowed him to play with. Um the Eagles are secretive about these types of things. They're not going to let us know until it's time to let us know. So we probably won't get any updates or any sure. I know we'll get the uh, the status report today, um, but I'm probably thinking he's going to be listed as questionable on that as well because this wasn't something we were hearing about during the Seattle game and stuff, and it's kind of popped up when the injury report came out on uh, Wednesday. But um, missed two straight practices, so that's a little concerning. Yeah, definitely. And uh, last question on the offensive side of the ball how do you think the O-line has played despite some of the in-and-out injuries to guys like Cam Jurgens? And apparently he's going to play this week because he's been a full participant in practice. I think Cam is going to be fine. I think um, I think the offensive line has been great. Um, I think Jordan Maylada, one of the underrated offensive linemen in the league, and I think the reason for that is because he plays next to a pro bowler in Land Dickerson. You got a future Hall of Famer in Jason Kelsey and um, an arguable future Hall of Famer in Lane Johnson, but I think Stars that need to start getting some of that consideration, even though we tend not to talk about him because we talk so much about the other guys on the line. Uh, Cam Jurgens has played well, um, possible eventual successor for Jason Kelsey. But even we saw some great um, snaps from Tyler Steen when Cam couldn't go against the Dallas Cowboys game and possibly save that game by jumping on a fumble. Um, so I'm pretty satisfied with what I've seen from them. Um, I think there's more of a need to, need to get them in a rhythm because just the – uh, it's just an erratic nature with play calling and things. But um, if we can get them into the rhythm, let those guys tee off, hit some guys, create some running lanes and stuff, we see how much more excited they are about what's going on when they're doing that. Um, but I'd like to see more from the running game other than just the brotherly shove in short yardage situations. I think they're still good enough to clear holes when necessary. Yeah, definitely. And then switching to the defensive side of the ball, what do you think of the silent, "Quote unquote switch and defensive coordinator from Sean Desai to Matt Patricia. Possibly a little panic. Um, I think we've seen sustained we've seen sustained moments of greatness from like uh, Sean Desai and sustained moments of just things that I saw were positive. Uh, shutting out the Miami Dolphins in um, <laughs> in a primetime game when we know we were still talking about how explosive they were and they are explosive." Um, doing a similar job against the Buffalo Bills um, when necessary. 
um, what he did against the Dallas Cowboys in the second half of week nine. So we've seen some great things from Sean. So I think a lot of what happened was, and shutting down Kansas City as well, but what you see is you get into a situation where you have a tight game against Buffalo, who is a good team, um, probably plays down to competition at time and up to competition at others. But um, after that, we saw the uh, the San Francisco 49ers loss and the Dallas Cowboys loss. And that San Francisco 49ers game was one of those games we actually saw like a one possession lead in the third quarter. So they were still in that game late. And then some unfortunate things started to happen and they just weren't able to stop anybody. And um, same thing with the Dallas Cowboys game. So maybe a little panic setting in. I would venture towards the theory of this was a difficult stretch for this team. And then they just got just a raw deal as far as scheduling is concerned. You get San Francisco and Dallas towards the end of a gauntlet in back-to-back weeks. And both of those teams have had 10 days of rest. Uh, and both of those games have used circled on their schedule and stuff. I think uh, I think maybe some panic set in. And I think more so the answer is it's going to – whatever Matt Patricia does is going to look better than what Sean decided in those uh, weeks because he was playing – inferior offenses as opposed to what you saw with like Dallas and, and um, San Francisco. But I think, um, I think I'm more worried about the fact of it now becomes impossible to go back to Sean the side. <laughs> if there's a situation where, you know, this Patricia thing fails. So we'll see what happens, but I understand the reasoning behind it. I understand the reason of wanting to maybe get something going, but me personally, I probably would have replaced Brian Johnson and probably tried to put the play calling in somebody else's hands in that situation. Okay. And the Eagles are the middle are middle of the pack in sacks. I believe they have 39 on this season. I feel like with Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis, Josh Sweat and Hassan Reddick on the edge, I feel like they could get a little bit more out of those four players and some of the other guys as well. Do you think the same thing? Do you think they're underperforming a little bit? I'm wondering if Jalen Carter's hit a rookie wall. Um, that's the most he's ever played, and as it, from his statement, the most he's ever lost. You know, the NFL is a grind, and um, as much of a grind as the college game is, NFLs there's nothing like the NFL. Uh, I think Jalen Carter's kind of hit a wall. I think Jordan Davis may be suffering from some late season fatigue, and we may be seeing some of the same from Josh Sweat as well. The 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 the, the issue there is you had like. A lot of guys there in the pass rush. Brandon Graham is getting older, so he probably shouldn't play as much. Fletcher Cox has turned the clock back to some degree. Mill Williams has had injuries from time to time. Um, we've seen all these guys miss a game. But um, Josh Sweat, Jalen Carter, Jordan Davis, these guys since the bye week just aren't getting to the quarterback with the frequency that they once were and stuff. That needs to change. And um, I think part of that needs to be in trying to get more snaps for Nolan Smith, first round draft choice, uh, invest in that type of draft capital in him. You got to get him out there early and you got to get him out there more often than we've seen him. But um, they've gotten next to nothing from him. And some of that, it isn't even his fault. You can't do much if you're not out there. So um, th- there's the rotation seems to be lacking a little bit. And it seems like that that rough stretch of game seems to caught up with everybody and everything. There's mental exhaustion. There seems to be physical exhaustion and everything. But um, hopefully, if we get into the playoffs and things of that nature, we'll start to see some of that turn around. But I think it's more so fatigue and everything and just an unfortunate situation where everybody kind of fell on like a, a bit of a slump at the same time. Yeah, definitely. Definitely agree. And what do you make of what's been going on at inside linebacker? You guys brought in Zach Cunningham. You guys brought in Shaq Leonard. Do you think the team misses T.J. Edwards? Team definitely misses T.J. Edwards. T. Uh, that was one of those. I wasn't as bothered by the C.J. Gardner Johnson exit. Um, I understood we were probably going to lose Javon Hargrave because it was just time for him to just blow up and get more money. Um, the T.J. Edwards thing kind of bothered me because he was homegrown, undrafted free agent, um, somebody that we uh, developed, uh, became a special teamer became a contributor on defense and eventually became a starter and led the team in tackles last year. Um, the And this goes back to the Andy Reid DNA. This team just does not invest into the linebacker position and do so heavily. And we saw that with Jeremiah Trotter, probably one of the worst standoffs in history as far as like um, <laughs> contract negotiation, uh, guys wanting to get paid and the franchise tags. The worst, worst <laughs> standoff between a player and the front office I think I've ever seen in Eagles history. 
But um, this is a team that hasn't drafted linebacker in the first round of any draft since 1979. That was Jerry Robinson out of UCLA, who I honestly don't even know much about. Uh, but um, it's just something that has been encoded in his DNA with Howie Roseman learning from the Andy Reid school of roster building and things of that nature where the goal is to take offensive linemen and defensive linemen, get those guys early, develop those guys, win in the trenches, force the pocket, and then occasionally pay some money to some guys in the secondary. But the linebacker position and the safety position both get ignored in that. Um, so I think they're missing T.J. Edwards. And I also think they're missing Marcus Epps. Marcus Epps was a lot better than he got credit for being and was more of a playmaker than he was being. But I will see. I'm, I'm still looking at Chicago and I'm seeing T.J. Edwards all over the field and making plays and stuff. And it's it's really difficult for me to understand with everything that we've done why we couldn't get that guy five million a year. Um, I don't know if Shaq Leonard is out of gas. Um, I tend to worry about teams who need great players when they give up on those players. <laughs> Um, and picking up players from teams who have been dismissed when we feel like, you know, that guy probably isn't one of those guys they should have been dismissing. So we'll see with him. Um, I know he showed up in the middle of the week for the Cowboys game and saw a little bit better effort against Seattle, but we'll see how he go- goes and how he does down the stretch. And the Kobe Dean, sir. They were expecting more out than Kobe Dean's, but he hasn't been around. Yeah, definitely. And last question before we move into the game prep questions. As a Giants fan, I know – kind of why he uh he's been playing bad because it's kind of in his nature it's kind of in his dna uh year one is usually good year two isn't uh why do you think james bradbury's been playing so bad um just regression we came into the league wondering if uh it was wise to pay two corners who are approaching 30 years of age uh darius lay already being 30 james bradbury turning 30 right before the season began so we were wondering if it was wise to pay two guys uh, exceeding 30 years of age, which is when typically when we want to start sending guys to the glue factory. Um, but the hope was they could probably run it back and duplicate come up some of what they did last year. Slate missed the last game, um, and he's also missed two prices this week. Um, and he's not playing to the level that we're accustomed to Darius Slate, but he's been solid. Uh, James Bradbury just – there's regression that's falling off a cliff. And I think James Bradbury has done the latter. Um, some of it could be misusage. He's more of a bump and run guy, not necessarily a zone cover four guy, things of that nature. But uh, uh, they've asked him to line up in the slot where you have to play shiftier guys. They ask him to line up on the outside against guys who are both faster and probably more physical and stuff. And it's kind of disallowed him to play his game, but uh, it, we're seeing, Kind of some of what the Giants were saying. The Giants had given up from, on him for the same reason, decided they didn't want to pay him. We got a nice run out of him last year, and we'll see going down the stretch. But James Bradbury is definitely concerned. I think he's tied for the most touchdowns given up this season. And um, when you have a Seattle team in Drew Locke who says, rather than go against Eli Ricks or Keely Ringo or stuff like that, I'm going to go after that guy, <laughs> and I'm going to continue to go after that guy and do so successfully, that's a concern, and that's something that probably we need to start addressing pretty quickly. Yeah, definitely. And then top matchups heading into this game that you're looking at, either, either player against player or play position by position. Um, Coaches against coaches. I'd like to see how the, the offensive staffs of both teams uh, to fare against the defensive staffs of the other. Um, I kind of like the Nick Sirianni, Brian Dayball argument. Uh, I don't. I would say I don't I still to this day don't understand how Brian Dayball could be picked to finish third in the division, finish third in the division and win coach of the year for that. <laughs> I understand there was some things that we got to adjust that we didn't expect, but I just don't think a third place um finish in a division where that's what we're expecting qualifies head coach of the year. But uh definitely coaching matchups because we spent so much time talking about coaching on this side of the ball. Um I like to see what Boston Scott does. Does he keep this streak going up against the Giants? Um, I know we'll see more. I just hope this serves, if he does play well, if you were to let his team know, yo, this guy needs to play more than just two games a season. Um, and I'm also looking at, because there's been a desire to try so hard to get the ball to A.J. Brown and get Devontae Smith and the, the ball in his hands in situations where you can't get the ball to A.J., i like to see those guys against Adore Jackson and um, Deontay Banks. I kind of want to see how those guys fare against each other. And um, I, that's probably one of the matches I'll be watching all season. 
And definitely uh, the linebacker core against uh, Saquon Barkley, just kind of seeing how that turns out. Because Saquon has had sustained success in big plays constantly against us. Even if it hadn't led to wins, he's had, he's had a lot of big plays against this team. Yeah, definitely. Uh, two X factors for the Eagles, one on offense and one on defense. Um, If Darius Slay doesn't play, Keely Ringo again. He, Keely Ringo was a lot more impressive than – because all we've heard about him was he wasn't ready. He uh, He's stiff. Uh, we know he runs well, but we wonder about whether or not he's locating the ball in that plays and coverage. He was solid on uh, Monday night. He tackled well. He was aggressive towards the ball. Um, he always seemed to be in position when um, the ball was flung in his direction. And you're really just not going to run past this guy. So Keith Ringo of Darius Slade doesn't play, which could be a possibility again. Um, X Factor on offense, I'd like to see Dallas Goddard. Like maybe this is the Dallas Goddard game where we try to get the ball to him a little bit more often. Um, same with Alameda Zacchaeus. Um, Julio Jones is here. Julio Jones is cooked. And I think Julio Jones's thing is if this guy can't, a future Hall of Famer, obviously, but not the guy he once was, if this guy can't beat the third cornerback on the other team anymore, it may be time to think about somebody like Alameda Zacchaeus, who has shown that, you know, he has a propensity to make big plays whenever, um, whenever the ball is thrown in his direction. On the defensive side of the ball, um, the guys you mentioned, Josh Sweat, Jalen Carter. Um, I'd like to see these guys get back on a hot streak and kind of prove to us that the slump was just that, but these guys aren't going to fall off towards the end of the season. Yeah, definitely. And then as far as the game plan goes, as far as looking at the opposition, two X factors for the Giants, one on offense and one on defense. Um, Darren Waller. Uh this team, just based off structure and the Vic Fangio, uh, uh, I guess the Vic Fangio blueprint, that's kind of what we built off of. Uh, whether it's been Sean Desai or whether it's been Matt Patricia, um, we saw this a little bit when Jim Schwartz was walking around back in 2017. Tight ends have just kind of, and Jonathan Gannon, we've kind of seen tight ends have their way with this team, especially capable uh, tight ends. And I guess I don't think you guys are getting out of Darren Waller what you thought you would get out of Darren Waller. But um, if there's any team that would allow tight ends to have success, it would probably be them. Um, and I'd like to kind of see how we handled uh, Kayvon Thibodeau um, having a great season, things of that nature. Uh, Kayvon is somebody I know coming out of college that with Oregon. There were questions about his work ethic. Was he uh, dedicated enough? Um, I think he got a bad rep from showing up to the combine and saying, you know, he didn't want to participate in anything because he was tired. It had been a long day. <laughs> And there was some negative reaction to that, but um, 11, and a half, 11 and a half sacks, if I'm not mistaken, uh, yeah. double digit sacks. Um, and I would assume that from what I've seen, y'all typically line, uh, line him up on the right side. So that's the Lane Johnson matchup. But if there's also a desire to put him on the other side, you got Jordan Maylotta over there who's um, good but still learning. So if uh, you can keep Jalen Hurts uh, clean, I think that will be a good thing. And kind of going back to one of your previous questions and stuff, um, I'm I'm satisfied with what I've seen from the offensive line, but there's also a tendency sometimes when you have a quarterback who is a playmaker who can run around and things of that nature and sometimes may abandon the pocket too early. You have situations where the offensive line has so focused on the guy in front of him, you really don't know what your guy is back there. So um, I think Jalen trusting to play a little bit more, this team developing schemes and circumstances where he can get the ball out a little early instead of trying to get everything 20, 15 yards down the field. Um, it's allowed him to miss some crossing routes and some guys who are open underneath, and I hope that changes here and pretty soon. Yeah, definitely. And then the final question to end it off, where can people find you find you on social media and your work? Oh, right there, at GQ Forever is uh, my personal handle on X, uh, Instagram, pretty much everything. Um, you also have at Inside Eagles, I-G-G-L-E-S. Inside the Eagles.com is the brand. And, uh, you know, we just try to deliver that great Eagles content daily. Well, as always, I appreciate you, Jeff, for coming on and putting out the uh, the Eagles perspective for this game. Uh, I'm not going to hide it. This game looks like it's going to be a total beatdown. So, um, you know, I'm, I might as well put it out there right now instead of hiding it. But once again, check out Jeffrey's content inside the Eagles, some of his social media stuff. It's for this channel, like, comment, subscribe. Turn on post notifications so you know when a live stream pops through drops. Five stars and Apple Podcasts. Do all the good stuff, folks. Most of all, have a happy holidays and a Merry Christmas. And we will see you next time. Peace out. Mm-hmm.